mentality I would think about more as like an outcome. And if you aspire to have this end result, the question is like, how are you going to get there? That's why I use the, the term mental game. This is the Man Up Podcast, a doctor's guide to men's health. Each week on our podcast, we interview the top specialists of the field on various topics of men's health. If you have questions that you are too afraid to ask, we have the answers. This week, our episode is titled Man Up Rewind, Mind Over Matter, How to Master Your Mental Game with Jared Tendler. I'm Dr. Kevin Chu, and I'm joined as always with my co-host, Dr. Justin Dubin. How it goes, bro? It's going well, man. We both got out. Oh, well, you're still at work, so that's why we're recording here, but we had to get the intro out. Uh, I just got back from work. Uh, uh, so, you know, we're trying to just uh, put out the intro, talk to you guys. Um, seems like everyone really liked last week's episode or last episode. Two weeks ago, yeah. Um, but we're going to go – right, right. So this week we're rewinding an episode that we did about this time last year because, you know, we had a lot of really good feedback. And I really enjoyed listening to to Jared Tendler. Um, talk. And um, I thought I really learned a lot. Now, Jared Tendler, for those of you who don't know, who didn't listen to the original episode, he's a leading expert on how your mental game impacts your performance. He's basically a mental performance coach. His clients really include world champion poker players, PGA tour players, entrepreneurs, you know, and hundreds of institutional independent financial traders. And he has a master's degree in counseling psychology um, and he's a licensed uh, me- mental health counselor. So this is a guy who deals with people in high pressure situations, whether it's in sports, whether it's dealing with a lot of money. And we talk about ways in which you can really be your best self and how to approach, um, you know, your everyday life uh, from a, a successful point mentally. Yeah, this was this was a great episode. And I, I think there's a lot of relevance to it too, especially I, I'm not sure, Justin, if you saw the sixty minute episode um with Djokovic. Do you happen to see that or do you happen to catch any of that on social media? No, no, I didn't see it. Should I watch it? it it's very good, very good. And there there's some highlight clips uh out on social media, but you know, Djokovic talks about, you know, his mental like how he approaches the game mentally. And how it kind of just relates to things in life, you know, and I think that's so important. And usually it happens around this time, you know, during the new year, you're like, oh, what are some resolutions I have? And you're like, oh, you know, this is something that I've been trying to put some more effort and more focus on. And you kind of lose that throughout the year. So that's why I think this episode is great because we'll be able to bring back a lot of this stuff talking about, you know, how do you evaluate yourself? How do you how do you take some self-criticism? And, you know, how do you how do you approach negative emotions? And, um, yeah, you know, it was, it's a fantastic episode. And I, and, and I think it's important to kind of revisit it and re-listen to it. No, absolutely. New year, new us. We all have that mentality. We're trying to change our ways. And I think the things we talk about with with Jared here are actually very approachable ways and, and like things you can actually change. And um, sometimes they're obvious, but it's really important. You know, it's enlightening still to hear someone say them. And, you know, he uses some really cool sports analogies. He uses some yeah. trade, trader analogies, uh, a lot of golf analogies for a golf fan. So you can actually apply a lot of this stuff into your <laughs> life, but into your golf game as well. So right, I think right, there's right. a lot of ways in which we can approach this. And I think that obviously this is a, a men's health podcast, but I think the same goes for the women if you're listening to this episode too. Um, but I think that's really it. I mean, listen, uh, we want to rewind this new year, just kind of, uh, we know that people are traveling. It's a nice little, you know, Kickstarter to get yourself thinking about your goals for the upcoming new year. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's about it. I don't know. Any other comments, Kev? No, I just want to thank our listeners for hanging out with us this past year. Um, I hope you spend some good time with your families over the holidays. And we are extremely excited, you know, in the coming in 2024 to kind of share everything that we're going to be doing with Man Up and uh, hope you're along for the ride. Well said. Yeah, I agree. We're, we got some hopefully new stuff coming out. We're going to change up a couple of things. We'll be announcing that hopefully sooner than later. Um, so thank you guys for listening. Um, uh, really happy holidays. Happy New Year. And uh as always, check out the website, support us on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, subscribe, download Spotify, iTunes, 
Um, uh, if you have any questions, concerns, you can always email us, uh, uh, themanuppod at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, thanks again. Enjoy the episode, this rewind, and uh, happy new year and happy holidays. As men's health specialists, we know guys are shaving their balls. Yeah, we examine a lot of you, so we literally see it, but we also have the data showing it, too. That's right. According to research, over 85% of men trim their pubes. Not only that, but research shows that over 70% of women prefer a partner with at least partially trimmed pubic hair. So, guys... We know you're trimming the edges, and we know that most women prefer you manscape. So if you're going to shave your balls, why not use the best men's grooming kit around? We're talking about Manscaped. With the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0, you get the Lawn Mower 4.0 with their all-new skin-safe electric trimmer that protects your balls from getting those cuts we've all had in the past. You also get the Weed Whacker 2.0 for trimming your nose and ear hairs. And let me tell you guys, we all need to do a better job of this. Yep, that's right. Kevin and I both have the performance package, and we really love it. Manscaping has never been easier for us. And for our listeners, we have a special promotion. Go to manscaped.com and enter promo code MANUP and get 20% off your first purchase. Go get your Manscaped products today. Your balls and your partner will thank you. All right, so we're joined by Jared Tendler, and I'm really excited to have him on. It's kind of a different angle we're going to bring you on. You know, he's a leading expert on really you know, mental game and how that impacts your performance. And we're going to maybe talk about other kinds of performance here that we usually just as don't talk in about. In my opinion, just as just important. As important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, just to kind of start getting into it, you know, you really focus on how the mental health as or the mental aspect of into the individual really impacts their performance, and you know. Bring this into our field, the urology field, the men's health field. You know, we as urologists, we deal with erectile dysfunction and we commonly see these healthy younger guys with erectile dysfunction. And, you know, a lot of the problems that we've talked about on this podcast already for these healthier, healthier guys is it's really some kind of performance, anxiety, depression. You know, they kind of get in their heads. They don't actually have health issues, sexual health issues, and we actually counsel them accordingly. So, you know, obviously when we're talking about, you know, sexual performance in our field, there is a huge mental aspect, especially with these younger guys, you know, translating this to where you come from, you know, we'll start off kind of simple. How essential is it really uh, to have the right mentality in achieving the goal, whatever it be, sexually, professionally uh, to set out the, the goal that you want to achieve. Yeah. Well, first off, thanks for having me on guys. Uh, you're, you're getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, clearly I am too. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's good in that regard all around. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about uh, something a little bit different. Um, I, I think we're going to try to kind of reframe the question a little bit, because I, okay. I think menta- mentality as an idea doesn't really capture, I think the best, um, like kind of direction we want to head for improving performance mentality. I would think about more as like an outcome, right? More of a, like a, like an end result. And if you aspire to have this end result, the question is like, how are you going to get there? And to me, that's why I use the the term mental game because it implies strategy. It implies ups Mm. and downs. It implies learning. It's not something that's like, Oh, I have read one of my books and it's like, ah, now I've got it. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Right. There's a continual evolution. And, and what that starts to do is, is like kind of reframe the, the most common issues that are going to affect performance in whatever domain we're talking about. So you mentioned right. performance anxiety, you mentioned depression, right? So to me, you look at anxiety and to me, depression is from a performance stand, standpoint, just low confidence. And so when your confidence is low, though, it's still an emotion, right? And, and emotions in my view, are signals or symptoms of the real problem. And so what we need to start to do is debug the system. So for example, right, when I was aspire- an aspiring golfer and wanted to play professionally, and this is my deal, like, one of the problems, now this was the only problem, right, when I would step up and try to qualify for the US Open, US Amateur, the big national events, I would choke. And I was choking because I was misinterpreting the signals of anxiety right? I was viewing anxiety as bad. Now, yes, of course, everybody talks about how it's a good thing. And, you know, even professionals feel it, but there was some element where I was trying to get rid of it. And, and 
when I started to reframe an understanding that, no, 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 actually, this is helpful. This fuels my ability to perform at my best if it's harnessed and honed in the right way. And if it's not, then at worst, the internal sensation of anxiety is a distraction. Okay. If I force you to feel how your feet feel on the ground while you're listening to me talk and you're focusing on my words, but you're remembering to focus on your feet on the ground, right? You, you go through that kind of alternating attention between yes, my 100%. voice and your feet. And so performance anxiety, right? And I'm not saying this is the only reason that it, it can occur, but the most basic premise is your attention gets focused inward and you're a no thousand longer engaging. Percent. Oh, a hundred percent. So it's just a distraction, right? And that, and that's, that's, and so yeah, guys that are struggling with sexual performance anxiety, what, what happens? You lose sight of the person that you're with and you mm. lose that connection. So all of a sudden you get in your head, you get in your body when you shouldn't be in either place, you should be right engaged with that person. Just like for me, I need to have really good sensation of what's going on on the golf course, right? What the wind's doing, what's this lie? Right. You have to have your attention and awareness externally because it feeds all the data you need to perform. If you're all in your head, you shut that off and you can't perform. Dude, so that, that's that just like one, one example. Yeah, it translates so well to like, you know, we've had a couple of people on and is that Kevin, that's exactly. So performance anxiety in sports and sex, it's exactly the same. That is it's, absolutely crazy. Yeah. Because everything you're describing Jared about how like you just kind of like, you're just stuck in your head and you're just stuck on thinking of all the voices inside and you forget everything on the outside. And I can't tell you how many times me and Justin have sat there and that's kind of what the patients are alluding to, right? When they're yeah. talking about erections, they're like, you know, it's just in my head. I don't know if my erections are good. And just like you said, they're forgetting everything, the person they're with, the whole social situation, everything around. And, you know, I, I think that's very, I, the way you put it, just like, made everything click and make sense. Right, Justin? You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a great connection. And I got uh, just a quick follow up because I think a lot of the times, both in sports and I think in other things, you know, people maybe in that, that anxiety is driven in the fact that maybe they care too much, right? Like maybe they're like so invested in, in the sport, they're putting so much pressure, right? Like that, that in itself, I guess, I don't know, is this, this external pressure, causing this within or is there two different layers to that does that make sense in what i'm saying it does and so i think to kind of follow up on what i was starting here too is like yeah, we're sorry. looking for these we're, no no it's, it all fits together so we're looking for these underlying flaws right so right so my false perception of of anxiety is an example of that flaw and so when we're trying to kind of debug the system we're looking for the cause of our emotional volatility, that the emotional intensity that's coming, whether it's fear, lack of confidence, overconfidence. And so, it, you know, to your question, like what, what is going to cause that anxiety to spike? So for example, right. And I know this is an issue, high expectations and perfectionism. Thousand percent. Okay? Mm -hmm. So those are underlying flaws that produce a lot of anxiety. They damage confidence. And so when you are put into a situation where you're walking in there with damaged confidence and, and I'll, I'll say the perfectionistic high expectation damage is, is actually quite simple in its, in, in its form. Now, I'm, again, I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but if you have uh, a high expectation, you are pretty much guaranteed to fall below that the majority of the time. And, and so that expectation kind of sets the parameter for how you measure yourself. When you reach your expectation, you get zero, right? You've, you, you've done what you're supposed to do. You Right. You don't right. get credit for that. Right. right. When you fall below, you lose confidence, mm. even though like you actually might be making progress factually over time. So here you are basically kind of beating yourself up for making progress, but not as much progress or having the results that you want. And so what happens is that transaction over time builds up what I call an accumulated debt, right? right. Your confidence has created this hole. Yeah. And so now what does it seek? It seeks perfection as the antidote. It seeks external validation. It seeks sexual performance as a way of making you feel good. And you cannot solve an internal confidence problem with an external action or result. So that's one example of the flaw. Now, other flaws might be, you know, the illusion of control or the desire for control, the wish for control, 
right? The, the desire to be looked upon in a certain way, right? And, and, and not actually factually having the skill to kind of back that up yet, right? And so recognizing that that skill deficit could be, uh, you know, uh, another like, uh, another cause. But I think th the simple answer for those listening who want to start to figure this out is what you'd want to do is in the situations where you're struggling, whether it's in other areas of performance or in the bedroom, think about the, the, the reaction that you have in the moment, right? When you were saying like you're getting in your head, well, let's actually get out of your head literally all the things that you're thinking about. So open up a Word doc, you know, take notes in your in your phone, whatever you got to do, like write down all the crazy shit that you're saying. Yeah. And the reason you're, you're the reason you're going to do this is because all of those thoughts are not bad. OK, they are highlighting they're signaling what is flawed beneath the surface. And you can't get to that stuff without using your emotions, using your behaviors, mm -hmm. using your thoughts as clues to, to deducing what's going on behind the scenes. And that's where the real magic occurs. Just to, to give you another analogy here, if you're walking down the street and you feel pain in your foot, I mean, what, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to ask yourself, why does my foot what's hurt? Causing right. the pain, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> what's causing the pain? I'm looking yeah. like, and what yet, the fuck's going on here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of course. Yeah. So you know, like you look down, you pull it, take your shoe off, and there's a rock in it, right? Of course. I, simple <laughs> solution, right? But when 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 guys, especially, and I and believe me, there's plenty of women who fall in this category too. When when we experience emotional reactions that we don't like, we say "f you" and and we want to like punish it. We want to like beat it into submission. We want to get rid of it as fast as possible. We don't say, "Huh, why am I feeling this way?" Right? And and I, I really do think that one of the reasons is because the therapy industry was not really geared towards men. Mm, okay? Interesting. And mm. and I think. By and large, we tend to be much more logical and linear and practical. And so what I've tried to do is to frame that for people that are obviously in high performance industries, right? And so golfers, poker players, traders, esport, young esport athletes, they don't want to talk about their feelings. They don't. Right? Most men don't. And most men don't. And so the thing is, you don't have to because the feelings are just the symptom. We don't, I don't really care how you feel. Okay. The feeling and the thoughts are just illustrating the data that we need to figure out what the real problem is. So it becomes part of the tool, not the, not the thing that's the problem. The emotions are not the problem. The thoughts are not the problem. The problem is that you don't understand what's causing them. You don't understand what the rock is in the back of your mind producing these overreactions in those moments. And if you can, again, use all those clues and debug the system, then over time, you can create fundamental upgrades in how you react in those moments. Because people think that the negative thinking is what causes the emotion. I'm in my head, and then all the thoughts spiral. Yes, that does create more emotion, but it For is sure. not the origination of it. The origination of it is the rock in your shoe, the rock in the back of your mind. And you have to find that and fix it. And when you do, you'll automatically begin to react differently in those moments. You're not it's like a, like a rubber mallet to your knee. You can't control these thoughts. You can't control these emotions from coming out, right? Your job at that point is to better understand what the hell is happening and then use that information to figure out why it is happening. Wait, so Jerry, let, let, let me make sure I got this correct. So basically what you're saying is we're, we're reframing the way we're looking at it. We're, we're basically like the feelings or whatever you have, that's not what we're focusing on, but we're using that as clues to identify like, more core things that we can address. Is that correct? More hundred percent, hundred percent. And so like in, in the trading book and the poker book, right. I talk about like 40 to 50 of these different flaws and there are lots of them out there, right? So the illusion of control, black and white thinking, perfectionism, uh, you know, expecting, uh, perfection, uh, uh like, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm struggling because I'm trying to look. No, for, there's like, a lot of no, issues, listen, but like, yeah, yeah. In, in, but in, it, like, in, like, in, in poker, yeah, it's like hate, like hating to lose, being very like, overly competitive, right? Um, you know, uh, fearing missing out. I mean, there's a lot of these underlying flaws that that are there, and so yeah, and that's, all these that's, flaws, that's the real problem. Yeah, they all directly, you know, we see guys, and they're like, hey, you know, this is my. I've gone on like four dates with this girl. It's got to be perfect the first time we do it. You know, expectations 
or flawed expectations, perfectionism. This is, you're right. And why are they getting in their heads? And why are they getting that anxiety? Because of that core issue of their unrealistic expectations or this perfectionism where they can't just enjoy the moment and be there. And that goes with basketball, golf, all of these sports. It's totally true. I mean, obviously you, we are all human. We demand um, for the most part, you know, we're competitive people. We want to be the best that we can be, but mm -hmm. there, there is a limit and there can be negative feedback or negative impacts of putting too much stress on yourself. Well, and it's, it's all about time and place, right? So if we're going right. to, if we're going to focus on perfection, especially to your point of like guys wanting this first time to be perfect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What does that even mean? It's a great right? point. The, the definition of perfection in my view is a moving target. Okay. And it's defined by our current capacity. So when you are, you know, having an intimate moment, or just, you can use girl, whatever it's sex, it's, it's sex, it's if you're, okay, sports, when you're, if you're, it's whatever you when want. Gonna, it could be whatever you want. Have, when you're going to have sex with somebody for the first time, right? You are bound by the limits of your capacity. And one of those capacities is you don't really understand the person that you're having sex with. That's a great point. Right? Very true. So, Very true. so how, how, how is it possible for you to have like the ultimate perfection though? You have That's to get, a great point. but, but <laughs> ass <Amazing> lucky, <laughs> but ass lucky. <laughs> Right. Literally so, so in, some in, guys are more lucky reality, than others, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, of course. And, and so most likely what's going to happen is you're going to learn from the experience. And then next time around, you'll have the opportunity to get better. Maybe not, though. I mean, there's going to be experimentation, figuring out. And then what happens when you're with somebody a long time? Like, you figure them out or they help you <laughs> if you're dumb enough. They tell you what they want. Hey, and then... you got a coach, right? You, you got some exactly. people need a coach. Like in golf, you need a coach. You got, you know, and whatever. Coaching's okay. Whatever, whatever it takes. But the key whatever is to get, to be open for criticism too. That's another aspect of all of this in sports and performance and maximizing your performance, right? Exactly. And that criticism is not a critique on your manhood. It's a critique on your performance. Those are two different things. And I think... Like, again, when people in golf and poker trading everywhere, they, they wrap their identity too much in it, right? I have to perform because my performance defines who I am, right? right? So if your performance in the bedroom is defining the same thing, it's like, no, the critique is not on you. The critique is on your performance. And so the more you can, I'm not saying externalize that, but just separate the fact that you have skill, that skill is going to be limited, that's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jared, actually, a lot of things that, you know, this is kind of on a tangent, but I think Justin and I, we're surgeons, right? And so a lot of the things that you're actually saying is really resonating a lot with me just from our training. You know, as surgeons, we 100%. go into the operating room, like everything we do when we touch the patient, perfection, right? Perfection. It doesn't matter what level of training. And that's that's where we're at. And, you know, you know, one of the things which we just kind of touched upon right now is about self-criticism. And I think that's or just, you know, accepting critiques. And I think that's hard for guys to do. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I think I think it's hard for guys to do. So how do you, how do you, how do you like, what's your advice? Or, you know, how do we get guys to get into the practice of self evaluation and self critique? Because I, I mean, I'll sell, tell you that that's we all struggle with it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, listen, and I'll throw myself in that category. I can, I can picture the moment as I was driving with my now wife, you know, we're, we were still dating at the time. And she unpromptedly, you know, was critiquing my website. Just like out of the blue in a car. Like, <laughs> oh, that hurts. That hurts. <laughs> oh, man. I was like, I, I won't repeat what I said. Um, <laughs> so, and we laugh about it now. But the point, but like, so what, 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 what got injured in me in that moment? What, what, why are we defending against criticism? That's a question. Y'all got to answer it. Right. And so, what are some common examples? Right. Common examples are, well, you're defending up against a weakness in your confidence. Insecurities or something a, like that. Insecurity. Right. Yeah. So like right. there's just, and some of that can be again, related to the perfectionism, right? Some of it could be related to the hatred of losing, right? The hatred of making mistakes. And so some of us have built up an intolerance for those things, not yeah. because we hate learning, but we just don't like the experience of being in a spot where we're not where we want to be. And mm. the discomfort of like losing and, you know, I didn't lose in that moment, but yet it felt that way, right? Or, right. I, so, but again, there, there can be many reasons for this. I, there's not like cookie cutter answers. There's I can give you examples of the things that many of you all will find, 
but you just if if everybody listening just starts asking that why question just like you do with the rock in your or the, the pain in your foot or like you would do with any physical ailment what 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 sends them to you because they ask the question why is this happening right or they identified something bad that's happening and they wanted to do something about it the, i think one of the reasons that guys people struggle with emotions is because we can't see it right we can't Good touch point. it we can't feel it so it's true it's kind of in our heads and so as a result of that it feels more personal and yet there is a parallel process from physical stuff mental and emotional stuff so yeah if you have an emotional injury that gets exposed when somebody is critiquing you that is no different than having a sprained ankle no different you find out what's wrong and you work at healing it and fixing it right but the surgical part of this gets really tricky because how do you navigate through these things? And that's what I'm saying, that, that that's what the system that I've developed is using all of the data, right? The thoughts, the reactions, the emotions, the physical sensations, the changes in your thought pattern, your decision-making, right? All of that data helps us to deduce what the heck is happening beneath the surface. Because once you find it, it gets a heck of a lot easier to fix. And then you're not defending against criticism. Criticism is just exposing that weakness. Right. But now how like, but, but guys, even to get to that point, I feel is a long way off for most guys. Like they won't even look like someone criticizing outside. Sure. But, you know, even self-evaluation to understand, you know, the weaknesses, you know, guys, for example, when they come in and we talk about their sexual performances, Kevin and I, we're like, Hey man, you know, like, we want you to acknowledge that, that, that there's a problem and half of these guys won't even do it. So like, how do you even get to the point? Like, obviously external criticisms are going to come and you, you created a good way to react. Like you have to internalize how you react to it, but the internal realization of things that maybe people aren't telling you or never want to tell you, but you want to become better. And that's it's the same with sports, right? Like, you know, someone's a professional athlete, but they, they have to still look inside the golfer or the poker player. No one's trying to help these guys. <laughs> They're going to be competing. There's only one of you. So how do guys just in general really start to look within to do appropriate evaluations of where they stand, you know, on anything? It could be sexual performance, regular performance, wherever. Yeah. I mean, I, this is a big problem. I mean, I, <laughs> we have a family friend who um, fell off a ladder and like broke ribs and didn't tell his wife for three days. Oh yeah. Um, that's like a minor like, thing. Like, like, things we've seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, a, a, another friend of my father, his, he went, he was so stressed out that he was blind like for three days and didn't tell his wife. Wow. Uh, so yeah. Uh, it, it, the, the, the things that we will do. <laughs> I, I, so we, we just have to kind of change the perspective around what it means to be weak, what it means to have problems. Okay. And if you are looking at this from an athletic athlete mentality, mm -hmm. um, we look at the Tiger Woods of the world, the Rafa Nadal's, yep. right? they hate to not know their weaknesses. It's the complete opposite of right. everybody that is trying to defend against this. I don't want to admit that I'm having a sexual performance problem. I don't want to admit that I'm struggling at work in this way. I don't want to admit that I you know, feel insecure dating this girl because I think she's you know, out of my league, right? But, but yeah, the athlete, if you're looking at it from a performance standpoint, you are weaker when you don't know your weaknesses. Cause guess what? They exist. That's, a, that's it is awesome. That's awesome. Functionally, yeah, yeah. That's it's awesome. functionally impossible it. not to have weaknesses. My mind's like, like already right that now. Is just, like... <laughs> that is just reality. It's just reality. So, so if you don't know what your weaknesses are, or guess what? Other people do. It's so true. That is, that is incredibly insightful, and you put it in a yeah, really a lot of things. Now I'll start to kind of like, like look. One of the one of a uh, you know, Doctor Mark Gonzalo. He's a fabulous surgeon that me and Justin learned from. But the things you just said, he wants to know, like he he doesn't want to not know his weaknesses. He that's all he wants because he's striving for perfection. But he knows to get to perfection, you got to address all those weaknesses, and you know. Wow, the way you just said it, everything just kind of like fell together, you know? <laughs> and no, it's it's like it's like a blind, like it just opened up a curtain. It's curtain, really interesting. Right? And one thing that I've always tried to do, I've tried to do that. You know, I I think that creating an environment wherever you are 
of honesty, I think is an important part of that, right? Like you don't want to be the guy with the big ego walking around, especially in your work environment, professionally, personally, wherever. And like, you probably want to create an environment where I'm like coming in, like, how can I do better? What did I do wrong? Like how every day, if you're thinking that way, you're only going to get better. If you think everything's great, how can you ever improve? And that's exactly what, what you're right. I mean, like the best athletes in the world, like you said, you know, they're getting better every day because they know what their weakness is. You know, we talk, we look at basketball players and we look at someone like Shaq and we're like, how the hell did that guy not make free throws? The guys put up more three free throws than anyone. He still can't make it. Obviously, I don't know if he was, a, he's had to be aware of it. Did he address it? I don't know. Maybe he did or he didn't, but he never got better. But there's, it's just the point. It's just, it's just the Still idea won five exactly championships. So yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. Like what, what's the motivator? I mean, I, we can, we can debate that, but I, I mean, I, I think the, the, the main, you know, kind of idea here, right. Is that there are, uh, there's research to prove that, uh, people learn less and learn slower when they're overconfident. Okay. And the research that I saw came from chess because chess is really, um, uh, there's just no luck in it. Right. It's, it, the, the just, it's right. like right in front of you. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, they can kind of measure, uh, improvement a lot, uh, a lot more accurately. So yeah, if, if you're going to have a big ego, you're basically choosing to learn slower and to perform less accurately over time than peers who, you know, are in an environment where, yeah, criticism and feedback is cultivated and weaponized to their advantage. And the more you do that, the faster you learn, the faster you improve and the more you achieve ultimately. So, yeah, I mean, being overconfident um, and, and kind of being blind to your weaknesses is great in theory uh, because it would be nice not to know them and not deal with the pain. But right you know, one of the things I think we fail to calculate sometimes is the, the pain of underperformance over a long period of time. Right. Mm. And, and so like that calculation like that. is harder for our brains to really yeah. wrap our minds around. So it's like, ah, self-preservation today means that, you know, well, no, in the long term, you know, maybe you think about this from a, like a financial sense. Yeah. Like, it's like, if you're, if your yearly return is 10%, but because you're overconfident, it's only 4%. The compounding effect of that oh, is so huge. massive. Huge. It's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. I just so got chills. Know. That's so, yeah. that's so true. It's like, in, like the, if you tell a guy, like, despite all the things, like you're exactly right. If you tell a guy, probably the worst thing for me, if you ever told me was like, looking back 10 years, like you could have done so much more, or you could have, you, you never reached your potential. That is probably at your core, at your soul like one of the hardest things to yeah. ever hear and to hear it that you were the person holding yourself back because you didn't mm -hmm. want to, you know, have any, cause you had this ego and you didn't want to, you know, address the problems, man, that kills, that kills anyone, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think when, when you look at like what's going to help kind of get you unstuck from all of that, you know, the, the ability to be honest, yeah, uh, is is important, uh, but ultimately, you know, the the motivation to want to get better, right? The the drive to be, uh, you know, the best version of yourself right. can be there, but but the how, right? And that's that's kind of what we're we're trying to nail down here. So you know, we we've talked about ego, overconfidence, and you know, some of the self preservation. One of the things we haven't talked about is kind of this fear of failure. You know, this this other aspect of just being afraid to fail. And so, you know, you, you coach a lot of poker players, golf pros, and, you know, sometimes you just lose, right? You're just on the losing end uh, of the game. And, and, you know, this is interesting because there are sports and activities that the baseline is almost just never winning. So, you know, Justin's terrible at golf. I'm okay. Um, so, you know, <laughs> but, you know, it, you know, when you're playing, you're just trying not to get to, the, you know, you're trying not to be the worst at it. You're the least bad at it. And so uh, this aspect of fear of losing prevents many people from succeeding, both in sports and in life in general. So, you know, from your standpoint, what's the best way to overcome this fear of failure and losing? Yeah, I mean, some of it does go back to right what we we're talking about, sort of the calculating the risk of not acting, the risk of not allowing yourself to fail. And um, I think one of the other points I was going to make, which I kind of 
blanked out on as I, you know, end my day here, um, <laughs> was, was that, um, every single client that I've worked with would rather give it everything they have and fail than half ass it or not give it all and succeed, which sounds strange, right? But it's so much more painful knowing that you've left capacity on the table, which is what you were talking about, Justin. So even when you succeed, right, it just, it will still eat at you. So when we're dealing with the fear of failure, right, you know, some people want to keep kind of one foot outside the door. They don't give it full effort because if they give it full effort and they fail, that hurts more or it's perceived to hurt more than if they kind of half-ass it and then they could say, well, you know, if I had tried harder, right. then I could have. It's kind of this sort of, you get to hold on to the fantasy that you you might have still been able to, that maybe you were good enough. And, and you know, there's, um, uh, I forget oh, man, who's, who did this research. Uh, it's, I'm sure it'll come to me as I'm finishing up today, but um, it basically showed like, so if we look at who is happier one year after winning the lottery or losing the use of your legs, you know, what would you think the answer is? I I would hope it was the lottery, but it sounds like it's not going to be. <laughs> well, it's it, it, it's a trick question because the answer is whoever was happier before before the event happened. Oh, interesting. Okay. And so what happens is you just, yeah, you like, of course, there's like a shot in the adrenaline or a shot of despair. And then you yeah. like kind of go back to your baseline. So, you know, the idea that like failure is so consequential, I think feel makes it feel a lot meatier and weightier. Uh, the other thing I would think about too is that subconsciously, so this would be another one of those kind of underlying flaws that are in there. People feel like failure is permanent. So because I failed, that means I'm a failure or it means that I failed and that I'm never going to be able to succeed. And ironically, that's actually a form of overconfidence. You think you know what's going to happen. You think that mm. you can predict the future. And so the fact that you're a failure and you're able to succeed, you don't know that. You're not a freaking psychic. Right. You can't predict the future. You don't right. know how this failure is going to lead. It's so like, again, we're just trying to come up with different ways of reframing what failure means, but for it to be like really personally effective, you know, those of you out there who are struggling with the fear of failure, you've got to ask yourself those why questions. And once you figure out the why's, then you figure out what's flawed with it mm. and the corrections will seem fairly obvious. What about, but like specifically when it's someone like a poker player or a golfer or, you know, in, in, ba in banking, even investments, you know, a lot of the time it's losses. Like Kevin said, you know, how are you dealing with, you know, if you're trying to do something and you are expecting, you know, eventual wins here and there, you know, like golfing is a huge mental game and you're not, you know, even the best golfers, they're lucky if they win, you know, one or two a year or a poker player, they're happy to make it to a final table. Right. So like, how do you change your mindset in difficult situations where, you know, the goal obviously is to win it all, but that's not going to consistently happen. I could, I guess that applies to a lot of things in life. You're not really going to always win a hundred percent because you can't that's life but like how do you change your mindset to kind of deal with potentially more losses than w's as you go on well i mean some of it is just simply making sure that you're not fighting against the fundamental realities of that environment right so as a poker player and a trader there is so much short-term luck where right you know it's a lot of situations are a coin flip and that coin flip can go against you right i've heard a stat that uh to win the main event you know, in, in, in at the World Series, right? Which is 8,000 players putting up yeah. 10K to play. To win that is the equivalent of flipping a, a coin and having it turn up heads 20 times in a row. <laughs> okay, wow. That's that's how much good luck you need. You could be the best player on the planet and you'll be out in the first level, right? you know, two hours in because you just, that's just the nature of the game. So, so a big part of it is like fundamentally understanding the nature of the game, right? In golf, how much luck is there? There's a lot. It's not as much as in trading and poker, but it's a lot. You know, I, I would imagine if you were in, in a medical profession where, you know, 70% of the people that you work, were working with died, okay, you would have to get like pretty well conditioned to that reality fast. Otherwise, sure. you're not going to survive. It's an right. excellent okay. point. So, excellent so point. like one of the things that, you know, like salespeople, I mean, you're a salesman, same kind of thing, right? It's an, it's a numbers game. 
if you're in the dating world, okay, somewhat of a numbers game, right? I mean, right. until you kind of find, so you have to get used to rejection and failure because it's baked into the game. Otherwise, you're not actually playing the game. And there's no opportunity for improvement because all of those losses Correct. are providing you with some form of progress, right? Like there's always something to be learned, which goes to your, to your other that's, point. Hopefully, that's a good I don't point. know not, if that's not, true. not always though. That's the thing. Sometimes the losses- <laughs> oh, okay. you, you Take it back, some, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, no, look, I mean, yes, I think in, in like more performance environment, listen, if you have a bad outcome with a client, for sure there's gonna be something you can learn, right? <laughs> right. But if you have- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Damn, I'm, I would now, think, I'm sad. I would think. now I'm sad because yeah. I was like, oh shit, like I'm learning. Didn't learn something. anything, Justin. <laughs> Damn. Uh, but like but like with poker players and traders and even golfers, sometimes the answer is no, no, that's just like that that's just an outlier and, right. and there's nothing I would do differently right. the next time around. So it, so the learning there is like keep firing, asshole. Like it just you just gotta keep doing it. But you know, yes, I think there are many situations where a poker player they're by themselves. Like if you're really skilled, you know what defines you at your best. If you're not playing your best, then there's something for you to learn. If you're playing your best and you're losing repeatedly in similar situations, yeah, right. You, you're going to want to learn something. But but you know the one offs are are, are I, I think that's where people get get a, a bit crazed because they don't want to lose at all. And then their mind explodes at the first, you know, instance the first loss it, or right? whatever, the right. first loss, the first rejection. And it's like, no, no, just chalk it up to frequency, right? Unless you have proof that you significantly underperformed, right? One of the easiest ways to know you've underperformed is that you know it for a fact immediately afterwards, right? So let's say, you know, you did say something pretty dumb and embarrassing to this girl that you were trying to impress. It's like, yeah. okay. I can learn from that. I but like, that. <laughs> I've done, oh, a million times. Right when it comes out of the mouth, you know you're in trouble. It's just like, I, good to talk to you. I'll see you later. Uh, <laughs> but but th then there are other times where like, I thought, right? And then you just get ghosted and you're like kind of like left with, you know, your member in your hand trying to wonder what's going on. And it's like, I, there's, there's actually nothing that you did wrong there. It's just, oh, her grandma died or something happened right, right. Or she was just like you know what i you know the wind blew in a different direction and her opinion changed you don't know you don't have full control so again unless you have verifiable proof that you've underperformed the losses kind of have to be contextualized in a way that's going to be meaningful for your learning otherwise you're just going to drive misperception right and bias and then overreaction and then changing maybe a strategy that actually would be working long term right now you start to kind of lose sight of you know the way that you make money as a trader make money as a poker player, perform, you know, uh, you know, with the ladies. I mean, if you start to kind of second guess some of the things that, you know, you naturally do well, then, uh, you know, it's almost like, like thinking about how you walk. Right. right. You don't want to yeah. be yeah. overly aware. I, yeah, of I will walk just... weird. You'll know, walk weird. You'll walk weird. You kind of just have to do sometimes is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah, and I think exactly. that that, that is such an excellent point too, because, you know, when you do something normally and you don't think about it, that's like, you know, Kevin will know as surgeons, we are actually at our best when we're probably just really, you, sometimes you just flow. You can just feel the flow. Yeah. It's the same of any performance when you're just do the going, dance. you know, yeah, you're just going, you're just going and you feel it and you're in that zone. And then when you start really getting in your head, you start criticizing yourself, being too critical, you can take yourself out of it. Um, so, you know, it sounds like, you know, obviously we're kind of learning how to deal with losing and we've talked about performance anxiety, but you know, what about, what are other mental barriers that you think that you see really a lot of athletes or perf like peak performers are prevent have that are preventing them from maximizing their performance and how can we kind of understand these and, and improve ourselves on in this matter yeah i mean i think some some are you know lacking discipline right there's a, a degree of uh, i can kind of get away with certain things and you know there is the that old adage that you know you don't rise to your aspirations you fall to the level of your training and and so mm. you know what does that mean in a sexual performance arena, right? I think it means practicing the right way. And I have had conversations. Okay. Okay. I have I have had conversations with 
poker players, some esport player, you know, just just uh, conversations with right, okay, with with guys about you know porn and you know, oh, Justin, we've talked about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 especially in today. There's just so much out there, and it can right. create more of a disconnection to reality. And the more you're disconnected Absolutely. from reality, right, you become the the golfer who's amazing in the driving range, and then you know chokes on the golf course. So, you know, I, I think you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be really thoughtful about how you're practicing and how your practices practice is <laughs> translating yeah. to the environment where it really matters. Kevin, we've talked about this, right? I mean, we've had a whole episode about this a hundred percent, you know, Dr. Lisa yeah. Paz is a good friend of ours. We've talked about the ways in which you can Use porn ways. She coined the diversification of porn of you. You know you, <laughs> the different porn she, that you're looking said, at. Yeah, we. Yeah, she literally. You know, going to having a good portfolio. She literally said yeah. you have to have a good portfolio uh, of porn. It was a great, great analogy to understand. So, so you're definitely not wrong, and I think that you know setting expectations with yourself and you know being honest with yourself. And um, I think one thing that is interesting for me is you know. Just I made this connection as we were just talking about this before, but you know your reaction to failure, right? Like you kind of said, like how we re- how we react to failure, you know, assessing the problem, being honest, and I think that's a huge issue with guys in the in the in the bedroom. But it mm-hmm. obviously, you know, it translates also to how how you guys perform. Like you know, you want to blame it on on the other person, exactly like you said. You know, it's their fault. Like you know, it was a fluke thing. Sometimes it is, and that's a good way to look at it. Actually, for guys, sometimes when they have a performance issue, and and that's interesting because you know you can. There's a couple ways you can look at it. Hey. You know, that's a fluke thing. It was a one-off thing. It, you know, it, it won't happen again, you know, and that's a great way to bring it into the bedroom and performance. But other guys, you know, when there is something that's like, oh God, you know, what am I doing? I can't do this anymore. Like, or they blame it on their other, on another person. And these are failed ways to deal with failure, both in the bedroom and, you know, I, you know, on the field or wherever you are, because in the bedroom, you're, you're, you're going to be suffering. Your, your partner is going to be uncomfortable. They're not going to like to be blamed. And that can end the relationship when you're talking about being on the court or, you know, golfing or poker, you know, you're getting into a scuff with someone or you're blaming yourself. You're blaming your caddy. It's never really going to be a great situation. Right. I mean, so, so like, I think that there's a really interesting connection of how you approach especially right off the bat, you know, like how do you like initial reactions? How do you temper? I guess this is where I'm going with this is like, it's hard to change your initial reaction to something because sometimes you're in the moment and, you know, we see athletes who are hotheads and they immediately react and that turns a lot of people off and that can happen in the bedroom. I've heard it. I know Kevin's heard it. How do you kind of prevent yourself from, you know, reacting so abruptly in such a negative way as a way to, you know, train for this? Is there a way to, you know, prepare yourself? Like, how do you do that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, it, it fits with some of the things I've already talked about, but to build on it would be that, that once you know what those patterns are, they're repetitive, right? They're, they're basically ingrained habits. You're really good right. at reacting that way. And so when you can recognize them in advance, then you can kind of prepare, prepare to defend against that. And some of that might be actually being honest with somebody and saying, Hey, look, listen, I have a tendency this can happen. If it does, don't take it personally, right? This is on me and I'm working on it. That diffuses it entirely, right? Because anybody that would would criticize that would criticize that adios, right? They're gone, right? Right. That's not something you want to be around. No, you're right. You know, any longer. So, so that, that, that's one way. The other way is just like for yourself, right? To start to have a correction to that. Now, when we're dealing with emotion, right? We have to deal with fundamental realities about how the brain operates. So, right, frontal lobe, right? That is where, you know, the emotional control center lives, right? Prefrontal cortex, Mm -hmm. red hot when you see a brain scan of somebody who's trying to control control their emotions. But what happens? Emotions rise too high. It shuts off that part of the brain. So for those listening, I'll be really clear. The part of the brain responsible for controlling emotions can be shut down by your emotions. (laughs) It's pretty wild. Logical. Does not get any more <laughs> doesn't get any more any more sadistic than that, right? Yeah. I mean, like if we're gonna engineer a system to for maximum pain, this is it. Okay. 
Now we cannot change this reality. What we can do though, is try to minimize right, the intensity of our emotions, which means we gotta be prepared. We have to see the pattern. We have to prepare ourselves with corrections when they arise. And those corrections are not to the emotion because the emotion is the symptom, we're correcting the flaw, right? So if it is flawed expectations of failure, flawed views of failure or mistakes, then you're ha you have corrections already advanced. Now, I do borrow this a little bit from, from cognitive behavioral therapy, right? In terms of a, a, like using thoughts to correct flaws. But the problem for me with CBT is that they're kind of generic and it's, it's like, it just doesn't get surgical. Right. And I think you guys will appreciate this, that we, when you get down into the meat and you figure out what is the actual flaw that you're dealing with, why are you experiencing this? Then the correction goes to that, right? It's like injecting weed killer into the roots. So the, the weed dies beneath right. the surface, not yeah. pulling. Right. So addressing the core that, problem, that's what you've got to prepare. Right. Addressing the core problem. So you're talking about like creating these, what I call injecting logic statements. Okay. Now, again, the other reason that I'm calling this different than what CBT does too, is because you need to train these logic statements. You need to train and prepare yourself like it's a mental technique, which it is. So here you have this idea of any, pick any one of the ideas we've talked about today that recontextualizes one of the issues you're having, write it down, study it, burn it into your brain so well that you know that under the heat of moment, it'll have some potency because what this process is like, and to your question of how do I fundamentally change my reactions? I'll throw out one more analogy just because that's how my brain works. Uh, chopping down a tree with an ax. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what this process is like. Now at the beginning, okay, the ax represented by the logic is blunt. You're going to swing that sucker and it's going to ricochet off the tree and not right. do a damn thing. And that's what that is to be expected. If you interpret that as failure, you're doing it wrong. Mm. Okay. Why? Because your emotions are more copper or, or they're bigger. They're shut down the part of your brain that's thinking. So that thought doesn't have potency because your emotions have shrunk that, that ability uh, to have some, uh, some, some potency to it. Right. So right now, now you've got the strength of the idea in your mind, which is reflected by your muscles. And so over time, you just keep swinging this thing. And the more you repeat it, the sharper it gets, the stronger you get, and you start making some progress. How long is it going to take? Could take four months, six months, two years, five years. But the bottom line is when you start to feel like you're making progress and you are actually chipping away at it, you'll feel the emotional reaction. Like that initial charge will decrease. That is an indication that you are fundamentally upgrading this problem and no longer just trying to kind of manage it and patchwork it in the moment. There you go. I that like was that. Awesome. That was I awesome. But let's, well, <laughs> just to quickly, like, just to get the guy using your analogy, just to get the guy up to the tree, though, to start swinging the axe to kind of say, like, hey, this is something I need to, you know, take care of. How do we even get that guy there? Because I feel like, you know, there's patients that we talk with and they're like, nah, dude, my mind's OK. Nothing that needs to go there. When we know that, you know, most likely that's what's going on. Well, if the problem's not in your pants, it's in the other head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. you got you got two options, right? It's either it's either there's something functionally wrong, or it's something up here. You got two options, so pick one. You're just gonna right. keep circling the waters. You're gonna pretend the problem's not there, or you're gonna deal with it where it is. I mean, you're right, uh, Robin Williams. The the line I always use is, you know, he said, uh, "God gave man a brain and a penis, and only enough blood to control one at a that's time." Right. So, that's right. You know, that's right. if it's not, if we tell you it's not your penis, it's got to be the be the other <laughs> thing, right? So you know, yeah. and it's true. You know, if the the mind is a powerful thing, it's yep. much mind over matter and mind over penis. Unfortunately, if if it's really one of those things, absolutely. But I, I think yeah. this is this was really well, excellent. I, and I'll, I'll throw I'll throw one more out there. Yeah, yeah. Yes, again, please. like along this along the lines of self criticism, I always say, be a detective, not a dick. Right. <laughs> That's like, perfect. Be, that be is... curious, be introspective, be just like gather up the clues. Don't be, you know, that guy to yourself. No, I think that was a, that's a perfect way to end it. Um, yeah. I, I, I thought that was awesome. Listen, if this you want to name really that cool. as the title of the podcast, I'm, I'm cool with that. Actually, it's not a Bama being detected. <laughs> <out of dick>. that's, <laughs> a, that's actually 
really, really, it's, it's perfect. It's a perfect way to summarize this conversation. It's a perfect Absolutely. way to conclude it. But um, listen, I, I can promise you for the friends that I've talked about this they I will, I will happily share it with all of them just for that, that fact. So there we go too. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and thanks for coming on. Listen, uh, really different talk for you, a little bit different talk for us, but yeah. it's really cool to see. And I think the important thing is like performance in life, in, in, you know, it, it translates to every aspect of, of your life and that mental aspect of how you, you want to succeed, how you want to perform, whether it's professionally, um, in the bedroom relationships, you know, family wise, it's, it's all the same and, and it all translates. And, and it's so cool, um, to hear your perspective and bring, bringing that to us. So I want to thank you again for, for coming today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what I'd say to the listeners is like, you know, I'm actually kind of curious now if somebody were to pick up the mental game of trading and used it for their, you know, uh, issues with sexual performance, whether it would work or not. Again, you'd have to kind of translate the material, right? But like, once you get kind of past the trading specifics, like all of the flaws that I was talking about, all of the real kind of meat of it, it's, it's like kind of agnostic to situations. Absolutely. You can make the most use of it. And like I've had many people who've picked up the poker books that were traders and esport. It's like it's all the same stuff. So I, 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 if if somebody who's listening picks it up and it works, email me. I want to know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that'll be that'll be pretty cool. Well, first off, first tell us uh, how our listeners can contact you, how they can follow you. Tell us about your books. So <laughs> you know, because it was a great conversation, and hopefully people will be picking up your books because because they're awesome. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yeah, jaredtundler.com is my website. I've got a bunch of free resources. If, you were, if you're really going to kind of do the work, right, there's there's a lot of worksheets that you can use uh, that are there. Um, at Jared Tundler on Twitter, uh, fairly active there. So, you know, by all means, you know, post questions there. I'm happy to answer them. Um, I do host a monthly office hours uh, on YouTube. Uh, there's information on my website for, for that and, you know, kind of sign up for the newsletter, et cetera. Um, and you're welcome to kind of come in and ask questions. And if you know, I get a dick question in there. I'll, I'll know where they came from. Um, <laughs> Give and, us a uh, shout out. Give yeah. us a shout out. I, I, I absolutely will. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Mental Game of Trading, Mental Game of Poker 1 and 2, um, you know, basically available wherever you buy books. Uh, I did the audio book recording myself. So oh, cool. uh, it is my, right. uh, my voice on there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, if you're thinking about getting the books, if you like poker or you like trading, obviously, like there's a slant there. But if you're unsure... I'd get the trading book because the trading book is like, you know, 10 years newer. Uh, and it's certainly more systematized and more robust. There's a lot more content and detail in there. Uh, but the method game of poker too is really like, if you're looking to kind of expand your performance, right? You want to get in the zone more often. You want to improve your learning faster. You want to be better disciplined, make better decisions in general. Like that's kind of more of the like a game improvement book. Uh, and so that one you can kind of mix and match with. Beautiful. All right, guys. So thanks for listening as always. Shout out to Jared. Thanks so much for coming on once again. Uh, as always, you can find us on all podcasting platforms, uh, Spotify, iTunes, uh, download, subscribe, give us a review. Five stars is always appreciated. You can follow us on all social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, at The Man Up Pod. Kevin, what's our site? It's www.themanuppod.com. Also, of course, and also YouTube. Can't forget YouTube. Oh, this yeah. is video. We're always on video. So make sure to check that as out as well. For Jared and Kevin, thanks for listening. Until next time, have a good one, guys.